ambassador in chains. So this is a message that is really on my heart this week. It's different. There's a lot, a lot, tons and tons of scriptures. I don't know how far we will be going. But these scriptures that we will see this morning will give us a more intimate look into the heart of Paul during a specific period of time when he was in prison in Rome and see some of his co-workers and see what's happening in, in, the, in their hearts. So that's really important, I think, for us because we live in a society that we look at everything that is uh, around us more with a materialistic viewpoint but in God's heart, the most important is that people will get saved, that the whole world will hear the gospel. So I think this message could um, revive our hearts, uh, light a flame in our hearts for the gospel. Amen? So let's look at some of the scriptures this morning and this text. This is a wonderful uh, look into Paul's life this morning. So we begin with these scriptures and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Verse 18, remember my chains. So we know that where Paul is, is it in prison. It is an amazing series of events that brought Paul to Rome. According to some archaeological source, uh, there were probably four million people in the city of Rome or more at the time when Paul went to this. It was a big city. It was a very corrupt uh, time in the city. As I said before, uh, there was a lot of uh, orgies, drinking, uh, uh, a lot of sexual immorality. Uh, it was a big city. Uh, sometimes we, we tend to imagine that it is different, that it is purer or more uh, moral because it's old. It's not. The human heart is the same. Look at the exhortations that you read in the New Testament. They are written in this time and they talk a lot about sexual immorality and all the sins of darkness and things like this. So during his third missionary journey, while Paul was in Corinth, he wrote to the Christian in Rome. And uh, we see in this uh, text here in Romans 1.10, where he expressed a strong desire to visit uh, them. Uh, if perhaps now at last I may succeed in visiting you according to the will of God, for I long to see you. But he didn't know for sure how his goal would be fulfilled. How, what would happen? So during the third missionary trip, he ended up in Jerusalem with a, a lot of his companions. You see that in the book of Acts chapter 20. And they were bringing a contributions to the poor. And then it says, after several years, I came to bring to my people gifts for the poor. But a rumor uh, quickly spread that the apostles had taken Greeks uh, to the temple and had defiled the holy place. And then I think you can see this text here. Help! This is the man who teach everyone everywhere against our people in the sanctuary. He brought Greeks and uh, because they had seen Trophimus, the Ephesians, in the city with him previously, and they assumed that Paul had brought him into the inner temple courts. And the whole city was stirred up and while they were trying to kill him. So a commander of the Roman guard took him and protected him, just saved his life. And then uh, his, his, his trials lasted for about two years. A lot of interrogations by King Agrippus and many different uh, governors, Roman governors. He, he was taken to Caesarea. People that vowed to kill him. It was a very dangerous time for him. He was subjected to many interrogation, and finally, after two years, justice was denied to him because they had no reason to keep him. So after two years of that, he says, but if no one of their charge against me is true, uh, nobody can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. So the voyage to go to Rome was very, very uh, detailed. You can see that many of his friends were uh, with him. And during this time, we can see that the voyage to Rome is detailed a lot by Luke. Uh, Luke was with him because he used the we uh, as we read about, about the, the, this, this trip. He says, we, are, we were traveling. When we entered Rome, 
Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier. And also the trip, the detail of the trip from Acts chapter 27 and 28 is a remarkable account of uh, sea navigation and history. So it gives you again a detail of what kind of uh, person Luke was, a detailed <coughs> historian. And that makes you and I be able to trust more and the, and the content of the gospel, because the details that he gives us, even for something as, as unspiritual as a, as a travel on a boat, is so filled with uh, details. So the accuracy of Luke's record is a striking example of the precisions of the biblical record. We can trust the scriptures, and we can trust the, the historian, and we can trust those who wrote about the events of the gospel. Hallelujah. So, you see in these texts here, when we entered in Rome, you, see, you will see that throughout this trip, Paul always was highly regarded and respected by his Roman guards. And because of that, he received always kind treatment. He was, he was respected. And uh, they didn't consider him as a dangerous criminal. They listened to him. You know, when they were on the oceans and the storm, they listened to him. Uh, he brought the word of God to them. So he was highly regarded and respected. And because of that, when he was uh, took to Rome, they allowed him, even though it was a sort of a, a prison, it was like some sort of a house prison. He was permitted to live in his own rented uh, dwelling. We see that Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. And you see more details, and they came to him where he was staying in even greater numbers. Some were convinced by what he said, but others refused to believe. And for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, and boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. That is important for us. So in this chapter 28 of the book of Acts, uh, we do don't have it in the scriptures, but he has two appointments with Jewish leaders, and he explained his position and his belief in the gospel and the fa his faith in Jesus Christ. And that time was the beginning of a fruitful ministry in the city of Rome. Paul remained there for two years. He lived in his own rented house, which may raise some questions. How could he afford? How could he live? And that, that is good because we will see later uh, how the Lord provided for him. You know, realize something. The Lord had told him at the beginning of his life that he would suffer for, the, for his faith and his ministry. And at one point, an angel told him, you must stand before Caesar. So he is there waiting for his trial over there. And many people came uh, to see him, and some were convinced, others refused. And he enjoyed a, a considerable measure of liberty, of freedom. He preached the gospel, and no one tried to stop him. Well, that is really a wonderful time. And then suddenly, the wonderful uh, record of Luke the historian abruptly stopped there. Finish. What happened? We have no details. Of, of more things, what happened in these two years and on the subsequent years of the Apostle Paul. And we may ask what happened during these two years. And we call it this time the mysterious silence of God. Why does the book of Acts stop here so abruptly? And we call it the silence of scriptures. And it's one of the very profound evidence of the divine origin of the book of books. And uh, some is historian, Christian historian, says that the Holy Spirit is the one who chose to limit the historical account. We have an historical account, very, very detailed. We get to this point, it stops. And we wonder why it happened. For you and I, who are Bible students, who, who, who learn fr about God from the Bible, and we want to deepen our knowledge of God, we must understand that this is a fact that biblical history is selective. We don't know everything about everything. 
we don't learn everything about certain events and certain people because it is not necessary for the cause of the gospel. It is not necessary for your faith. It is not necessary in the big plan of redemption. The, the God is interested not to only uh, satisfy our curiosity. Oh, what happened? I want to know more. God is interested that you will know what concerns the faith, the salvation, th the truth of the gospel, so that people will get saved. So that is why this book, the book of the Bible, the New Testament, is not about the life of Paul. Though we learn a lot of things about the, the, the life of Paul, uh, the, the account given by Luke to us, it's not the purpose, the total purpose is not about the life of Paul. It is about the spread of the good news. If you look at the pattern in the book of Acts, as Pastor Jennifer already uh, highlighted many places, in the book of Acts, I think there are five uh, stops. Uh, a different uh, part of the progressions of the gospel, the book of love, where there is a statement made and the church were growing. Or uh, there was peace. Uh, this is, and now they moved to this other place and this is what happened. There are about five uh, periods of time. So here we come to the end of the book of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of Luke and then you come to the end of the book of uh, Acts in the chapter 28 and the narration stopped there because it's not there f about, about Paul. It's about us knowing that the gospel has made progress. The gospel started, as Jesus said, in Jerusalem, and it went through Samaria, and it went further down, and it went to the center of government of the world of the time. It went to the most important place. It's the, 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 the growth of the gospel. God thought it's not necessary to write an additional book describing the continued history of the church because he has uh, reached the goal for our faith. The good news has been preached and established at the center of trade and government and it would spread from there across the world. The gospel reached Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now the Gentile world. And Paul was in Rome, proclaiming with complete boldness, without restriction, and this is, Acts ends with this note, despite all the attempts to stop it, the message went forth to Jerusalem. So that is why it is important to know some of these events, amen? So the angel told you must stand before Caesar. So after the closing of the book of Acts, you can only learn about Paul and the events of his life from his later writings. Because when he was there, he wrote some letters and uh, he expressed his emotions and he, he talked about friends and he told them about the condition of the church and things that he must do. He's, he's, he's welcoming one of his co-workers, he's sending a, another one to another place and it's important for us to do that. So when we study the final letter of Paul, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus, we conclude that Apostle Paul was released from the initial Roman confinement so that he could go on further to evangelize the world of the empire. We don't know where he went. Has he gone to Spain like he was? So some historians are trying to, to dig into archaeology to find some proof. So we don't know. God did not tell us. But we know that he went out because you have the context of these letters. During this time, the apostle wrote four epistles call them the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And so by gleaning and fall into these letters, we can learn something more about Paul's trials, his achievement during this period, how he, he, he lived, and his friends around him. And then you will find that uh, though he was granted freedom during his first imprisonment, he was still a prisoner. And this inflicts a lot of stress on him. And in his letters, he often refers to himself as the prisoners of Christ, the prisoner of the Lord, and the ambassador uh, in chain. So that is how he is seen. This is a classic uh, rendition of 
Paul at, at the time. Pray for us too that God may open a door for the message that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Amen? Hallelujah. Following together? Yes. yes, amen. I know that sometimes his story is not the, the cup of tea of everybody, but these are important for us so that we know the, the context of our heroes, our Christian heroes. And by looking at the life of a, of a warrior of God, for me, it's always been important as in my development as a Christian and in my faith. When I was a new believer, these stories of missions have turned me into a missionary. I am here today because of the context of these letters, because I was talked about it, and, and, and I had these heroes before, before me. So here you will find the name of one of his co-workers, Onesiphorus. Wow, what a name. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And then in that context here, you are aware that chains were a matter of, of shame. A lot of people don't like to be associated with prisoners. A lot of people will stay away. Also, there is a fear that by association you can be arrested. Remember Peter? Peter denied Jesus because he was afraid to be associated. There was uh, angry people around him accusing. You know, so in that context, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. That is what he said just in that text before that. But then we come to verse 16. It says, May the Lord grant mercy to the households of Onesiphorus, for ye often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Here is one who is not ashamed of his chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me and it continues talking about him. You well know all the service he rendered to me and Ephesus. So who is this Onesiphorus who is not ashamed of the state of Paul as a prisoner? And Paul refers about chains and prisons because also it is a reminder to us that there is always a possibility for Christians all over the world to be persecuted. And Paul says also to Timothy in his letters, all those who want to live godly will be persecuted. So this is something we must be ready. If you have ever come across to live the way of the cross, this is a small book that we and the, when we were in Bible school, we were forced to read because it's a, a classic, the way of the cross, so that Christians can carry the cross, can think about the cross, the shame of the cross and the glory of the cross and live your life as a Christian by faith without you know, missing the point, missing the point of, of the, the bonds and the chains and the suffering that comes with the call of the gospel. So Onesiphorus was not ashamed of Paul's chains. Who is he? He was from Ephesus. His family were Christians. And he helped Paul in many ways while they were in Ephesus. He came to Rome, he searched for him, and he found him in a prison cell. When Paul wrote Second Timothy, the text that we are reading here, he was in a prison cell. Second Timothy is a different uh, imprisonment. It's not the one that you read the two years at the end of uh, the book of Acts. After the book of Acts, the, after the two years, by the context of 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, you know that he has been released. He went to preach again, but his last imprisonment led him to be executed. And his last imprisonment was a place of suffering. It was not uh, the freedom of, of the, the house, uh, dwelling in the house uh, by, his, by himself. He, he was really in prison and bound in chains and his suffering. So that is how he, 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 he met this, this friend, Onesiphorus, who searched for him. You know, we learn about the character of, of someone sometimes by association and by action. You see that uh, Onesiphorus was not ashamed of my change. It tells us something about his character. Because it, I read somewhere a, a quote, a man's chain often lessens the circle of his friends. The chain of poverty keeps many people away. And so does the chain of unpopularity. 
People like to hang out with the popular crowd. When a man is in high standing, he has many friends. <coughs> so here Paul was in the worst place in society, and this man sought for him and found him. The name on his first means help bringer. And there's an exhortation in that story. Is there someone that God would want you and me to be an Onesiphorus uh, too, to seek them out and not to be ashamed and to bring refreshment to them. Praise the Lord. The message of Paul, you see that in the following scriptures, became to know. He was a very famous Christian prisoner. Imagine he was in Rome. And in Philemon 1.13, he says, it has become known through the old imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And Philippian, sorry, I, I'm saying that the, over here. Philippians 1.13. It has become known throughout the old imperial guard. Actually, the word here is praetorium. And praetorium, as people interpret it differently, praetorium, if we talk about the guard, it talks about 10,000 uni special unit soldiers in Rome with privilege. Double pay. They are the, emperor, the emperor's special unit uh, security. And the emperors have to deal correctly with them because they, have a coup, can, they can, they can uh, bring a coup d'etat or something like this. So Praetorium also could be the governor's palace, uh, the emperor's palace. It could be a judicial court. And whatever it is, Paul had access to the soldiers, he had access to the politicians, he had access to the workers and the palace where he was kept in this environment. And it says it has become known throughout the old imperial guard and to all the rest. So anybody else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And then we also read a text that uh, all the saints greet you Philippians 4.22, especially those of Caesar's household. So here is a group of Christian, Roman Christians here, who are working in the palace in Rome. They are in contact with the, the, the crowd of the emperor. They have access, I don't know to in which way, but they are Christians and they have known that Paul is in prisons and they know the, the gospel has come to even as deep as the, that place. And then Paul goes on to say that the Roman Christians, because of his imprisonment there and the way that he was sharing the gospel everywhere, were more abundantly bold to speak the word of God without fear. You can see that, I think, here. My imprisonment has caused the brothers to become confident to speak God's word more boldly and courageously than ever before. What a wonderful story that we, that we have in this text here. And then there were not only the good things, there were disappointment. Because at the time when Paul was in shame, and as I said before, change is also a place of, sh of shame. Change and shame goes together, and people don't want to associate. So other Christians, and you read it in the book of uh, Philippians again, the, the, they went preaching Christ out of wrong motives. And even Paul says in the book of Philippians, to raise up afflictions, even to hurt him. The guy is in prison, is suffering for Christ, and it changed because of the gospel, and these Christian wants to hurt him. They want to preach in a way that people will think ill of him, that, it, he, that maybe it was his own mistake. I don't know. But you know, you understand that? You know church garbage? that we will call things that comes in between and rumors that starts and some, th some words that are spoken just to dirty someone else and things like that. So Paul went through that w at his worst time when he was in prison, so you can imagine. And he talks quite a lot in the book of Philippians about his feeling and things. And at the end he says, I don't mind if they talk about me. And basically I'm just paraphrasing, I don't mind if they are against me. If they preach Christ, I'm just okay with that. So that shows you, again, the height of the Apostle Paul. He says, I want you to know that everything that has happened to me is very positive about all of these things. Everything that has happened to me here turned out to 
the progress of the gospel, to advance the gospel. So Paul viewed his troubles very positively. And he even believed that this will bring about his salvation or his deliverance. He says it also in Philippians. And when you examine the, the Paul's prison letters, you see glimpse of Paul's courage, of Paul's uh, quick being quick to forgive, to overlook offense, and to trust in the Lord and not always put this trust, even though if people disappoint you, you still can go on with your faith because your faith is with Christ, your relationship is with Christ, and that's a lesson for us also. When people are not living up to your expectation and you are disappointed by people's um, uh, things or words or uh, uh, actions, hold on to Christ. Uh, look up to Christ because your relationship, this, He is the one who died on the cross for you. He is the one who gives you this wonderful promise of eternal life with Him. So don't always be disappointed or quick to be disappointed and keep the offense in your heart and ruminate about this and uh, get bitter and have resentment. Just leave it up to God because Paul says everything that has happened, even the negative, has turned out for the advance of the gospel. So praise the Lord. So now we want to look at some of the companions of Paul. We already look at uh, Onesiphorus, but we want to look at some of them a little bit more. Wow, we're going to run out of time, I think. Praise, praise the Lord. What I must do this morning. <laughs> Aristarchus, Aristarchus. How many of you know Aristarchus? You know, you read these letters so far. Uh, many of you have read these texts hundreds of times, and you still don't know who is Aristarchus. Eh? So it's wonderful to stop and look at who this man is. Aristarchus, who is in prison with me? Ah, he is in prison with me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. people were looking, where is he, where the pastor is? He's in prison with me, and he sends his greetings. Hallelujah. <coughs> Aristarchus joined Paul on his third missionary journey as a traveling companion from Ephesus. And he was roughed up. You know the big riot in the Ephesians when the when uh, and they did. You know, Pastor Jennifer just preached about that not too long ago when they delivered the, the slave uh, girl who had divinations, and then they were taken, and then they were the, the people were losing the popularity of their statue of the Diane, the great goddess of the Ephesians, things like that. So that's the story here. Luke uh, Acts 19:29. The uproar spread throughout the city, the mob grabbed Gaius and Aristarchus, two Macedonians. So we find them over there among the, co the companion of Paul. Aristarchus was a Jewish convert. We see that a little bit later in some of the text. I'm sorry. Yeah, here, I think you will find it. He is mentioned as a fellow worker co-worker who brought Paul comfort in his suffering. These, talking about Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice, are the only men of the circumcision among my co-workers working with me here for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. And the word comfort here is like a medical term to bring some um, soothing, some calm into his, the storm of his life. I think it, it, it would go very well with our Bible study, anxious for nothing. You know, when you, you, you feel this anxiety and uh, all this. And these people were Jewish convert, and among all the Jewish convert, only three of them brought comfort. And Paul, they were my co-workers in the kingdom of God. So that's something we learn about our, uh, our Aristarchus. Let's go to the next one, Tychicus. Do you know him? <laughs> Aha, Tychicus, yes. I don't know if I pronounce it properly, but he joined Paul in Greece after the riot of Ephesus also. Several men were traveling with him. And here you have a, a, a glimpse. I did not put all the names, but I will read it. Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea. So Berea is mentioned, a town. Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica. Gaius from Derby. 
Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. So these are some of the companions traveling with him. And Tychicus is to Paul like a messenger. He transported letters and delivers news to the Colossians and to uh, the, the, other, the other town also, the Colossians and the uh, Ariapolis or something like that. The two towns, uh, Laodicea and all this. So they were transporting letters. You see that. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother. L listen to that. A beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. And I, I, I stopped this morning as I was reviewing my notes. I was telling what a good thing that goes often not together minister and servant leader and servant that is we need more of that in, in churches and in the and any types of ministry and christian organization you need that minister they can minister to god they, they understand the kingdom of god they are zealous for the things of god but they have the height of a servant and that is what we learn about tichikus here and I'm sending them to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he, this wonderful co-worker, will encourage you as a gift. He has a spiritual gift. When Paul sent him, wherever he goes, the church will be encouraged. That smile will come. Even though there's bad things, imprisonment, and the Roman Empire where Christians are persecuted, this man comes to the church and people can smile. People can rejoice in the Lord. People can find hope in their faith. Amen? That's, that's wonderful. We need, we need more people like that. That's why we need to pray for the pastors so that when they open their mouth on Sunday morning, there will be some comfort and soothing and, and healing and joy. And then the, the faith is being revived and all of these things. So Paul uh, consider him as a possible relief for Titus and Crete. You see that in one of the texts. I'm planning to send either Artemis or Tychicus to replace Titus and Crete so that Titus can come to Paul and minister with him, but he needs a replacement. So you see the exchange, you see the teamwork, you see the leadership of Paul. I mean, you're talking miles and miles, and you're talking of traveling by boat, by foot, and for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So these people have love for the gospel. They are on fire for God. They don't consider their own life. They just give wholeheartedly their life for the, for the furtherance of the gospel. Amen? Amen? Onesimus. I think this one we know quite, quite a lot. We are more uh, Onesimus. Onesimus is, is a wonderful story of redemption. Very, very good. But not many of him would consider this thief, slave, to become one of the faithful associates of the Apostle Paul in the ministry. Okay, I mean, he's a thief, he's a liar, and he's a runaway, he's a fugitive, and then he ends up. And then that story, you find God's providential work. How God can orchestrate someone to come to the end of his rope, to lead someone to the right place where you will find the right person, where you will hear the right word, where his heart will be convicted by the Holy Spirit and he will become a, a born again Christian. This is wonderful. He ran away to be free. He ended up in the prison in Rome. This is God's doing that sometimes. <laughs> you want freedom and up in prison, but not any prison where the Apostle Paul is. And the Apostle Paul led him to the Lord, and he calls him, my dear prayer. Did, did, I, did, did we move? Yes, thank you very much for your help. I think I did not click this one, I'm not sure. Hey, and then he was probably a defrauder. He says, uh, now he's talking to his master, Philemon, in a letter, and if he has defrauded you of anything, if he stole your money, if he owes you anything, put it on my bill, I will pay it for him. Paul was really serious about his love for this new convert. 
and he trusted that he was a true conversion and that he became a useful perf person. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Uh, that reminds me so many stories in my early years in China when I was going to the south of Henan province and this big network of uh, house church. Well, they have been in prison so many times. I've heard so many prison stories and conversion stories and healing stories and baptism stories that are told by them to, to me. In prison, they baptized people. They were praying in this, uh, this cell filled with, over, over full with people. And then the other cell, some people would believe in Jesus and be, be, be safe. And they would baptize them in prison. I heard so many stories like that. God is not bound. And Paul says it in many of his letters. He, he, the text, I think we will probably read it at some point. I may be in chain, but the word of God is not in chain. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then he says, I am sending Onesimus. Uh, this is later on in Colossians chapter 4. A faithful and beloved brother one of your own, so he is from that place. He and Tychicus will tell you everything that's happening here. What a glorious story of redemption. And also note this, that the text of Philemon, is, somebody says, there may be no other document in all this story that has done more to alleviate the evil of slavery than Paul's letter to Philemon. This document and history has been quoted, read, uh, be because, you know, in the uh, empires of the world to alleviate this, the state of slavery, to, to stop it from happening. So probably no other text than the text of our Apostle Paul. Amen? Yeah. And we have read before in Acts chapter 28 verse 30 that Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. So how can you live in prison, in Rome, in a foreign land, you are in prison, you don't earn money, and then you are uh, living in your own apartment and your own expenses. So I don't know what the apartment was like, probably not a luxurious place. But you learn at this point another one that is important, Epaphroditus. Do you know Epaphroditus? Ah, he's a nice person. You want Epaphroditus to be your friend. You want him. He's mentioned in the Philippian letter. And by his name, think about his name. Aphrodite. Aphrodite was a, a, a goddess, a pagan goddess. So you know probably from what is his family background, just by the name he was given at, at birth. So Paul says, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldiers, and your messenger and minister to my need. That's quite a long list of compliments and praise that he is the name given. And in the context of that, Paul is in prison and his own dwelling and at his own expenses. Oh, how can he have the church of Philippi, who has been in partnership since its foundation in 10 years? have been a partner, financial partner, with Paul and his missions, and they sent a faithful brother, they call him an ambassador, a faithful messenger, Epaphroditus, and Paul in Philippians chapter 4, 18 says, I have received all. I abound. That's a little bit from the King James terminology, but that, that's very meaningful. I have been filled having received from Epaphroditus what you sent, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, very pleasing to God. Here is a man that is so highly regarded that he is commissioned by his, by his church to be the one to bring support, financial support on the mission field over there to Apostle Paul who is in prison so that Paul can live in his own dwelling and continue to spread the gospel through all the praetorium over there. This is a wonderful story. And then look at the Apostle Paul, how he speaks. And then you know the context in Philippians chapter 4 where he says, I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret to be content. And you find it here because he is in prison and he says, I abound. 
I have enough. I'm okay. Thank you so much. You've been so generous to me. You know, normally when you are in prison and in chains, people don't say I'm abound. <laughs> I, I have everything, you know. Hudson Taylor says, God's work carried on in God's way will never lack God's resources. And that is what uh, Pastor Steve always taught in Lighthouse from the beginning of the foundation of Lighthouse. If we do God's work, God's way, God's resources will always be there. Amen? Amen. And by the way, it's Pastor Steve's birthday today. Uh, so if you think of sending an email, but they, they have problems with their, with their Facebook, uh, the uh, internet, Wi-Fi and everything. All resources are the providence of God, the power of God and the promises of God. So Epaphroditus was highly regarded. Epaphroditus stayed in Rome. After he brought the money, just, just didn't disappear, but he stayed there and he assisted Paul. And the apostle Paul considered Epaphroditus very, very dearly. My brother, relationship, intimate relationship. My co-worker, he works with me for the gospel. And the term fellow soldiers is warrior together or associate and labors and in difficulties and in conflicts. So that's like uh, someone who can take tough conditions. And your ambassador sent on a mission and minister. And the word minister here is a special word because many times in the New Testament, the word minister is the same word as deacons serving at the table that is used for Jesus, for the apostles, in uh, Acts chapter 6. But here is the word liturgi liturgus. Liturgus t comes from a li liturgy, a ministry unto the Lord. So he is. One that is ministering is like a pastor. He brings spiritual refreshment to the Apostle Paul. He, he brings a spiritual ministry, a spiritual gift with him. He's not only s serving materially, but he is, when he opens his mouth, when he does something, he's, he's serving God throughout his heart. And he's bringing his ministry like a pastor to my need, to my necessity. And Epaph Epaphroditus, worked so diligently that he became so sick that he almost died. And you can think we, we see that in that part here. I shorten it a little bit. He greatly missed you and he was distressed. He was not distressed because he was sick. He was distressed because they heard the church, his own church heard that he had been sick and almost died. He was concerned. In fact, he became so healed that he nearly died. But God showed mercy to him, and not only to him, but also to me. So that I would not have grief on top of grief. Therefore, now Paul is releasing him. He's appreciative. He wished that he would keep him with him. But having been near death, ex uh, experience, and sick, he's releasing him to go back. I'm eager to send him so that you will see him and can rejoice and I can be free from anxiety. Like, uh, I don't want him to die here. Like, uh, uh, he will be there with his family, with his church family. So welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him since it was because of the work of Christ that he almost died. He risked his life so that he could make up for your inability to serve me. So the church at the distance, is long distance, is in prison. They have commissioned him to go. He risked his life. So he went beyond. He worked too hard. He, you know, like he, that's why he got so many titles. My brother, co-worker, warrior together, your ambassador, minister unto God, but to my need. Amen? And then Epaphroditus returned to Philippi, bearing this letter to the beloved brethren. And I must stop here. Amen. <laughs> Actually, I have, I have quite many few more people that uh, are wonderful example of com the type of companion. So by looking at the life of Paul that, and these letters and looking at some of the mention of his co-workers, it gives you glimpse in the courage in the faith, in the zeal of the Apostle Paul. And I don't know if it does an effect on you, but it does an effect on me because it's, it stirred me up. It, 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 it challenged me. It's like when you go to mission and you see committed 
pastors and missionaries that you work with. It just refresh you. It's just something. And, and that is, it must be contagious by the Holy Spirit that we are this kind of companion, these kind of ministers, these kind of ambassadors, these kind of people with gifts of comforting and encouraging to one another so that the church can thrive and the gospel message can ring out from us to wherever the Lord opened doors. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.